War and Peace, Book 13, Section 11, read for LibriVox.org, by Miriam Esther Goldman. Early in the morning of the 6th of October, Pierre went out of the shed, and on returning stopped by the door to play with a little blue-gray dog, with a long body and short bandy legs that jumped about him. This little dog lived in their shed, sleeping beside Karatayev at night. It sometimes made excursions into the town, but always returned again. Probably it had never had an owner, and it still belonged to nobody and had no name. The French called it Azor. The soldier who told stories called it Femgalka. Karatayev and others called it Grey, or sometimes Flabby. Its lack of a master, a name, or even a breed, or any definite color, did not seem to trouble the blue-gray dog in the least. Its furry tail stood up firm and round as a plume. Its bandy legs served it so well that it would often gracefully lift a hind leg and run very easily and quickly on three legs, as if disdaining to use all four. Everything pleased it. Now it would roll on its back, yelping with delight, now bask in the sun with a thoughtful air of importance, and now frolic about playing with a chip of wood or a straw. Pierre's attire by now consisted of a dirty, torn shirt, the only remnant of his former clothing, a pair of soldier's trousers, which by Karatayev's advice he had tied with string round the ankles for warmth, and a peasant coat and cap. Physically he had changed much during this time. He no longer seemed stout, though he still had the appearance of solidity and strength hereditary in his family. A beard and moustache covered the lower part of his face, and a tangle of hair infested with lice curled round his head like a cap. The look of his eyes was resolute, calm, and animatedly alert, as never before. The former slackness, which had shown itself even in his eyes, was now replaced by an energetic readiness for action and resistance. His feet were bare. Pierre first looked down the fields across which vehicles and horsemen were passing that morning, then into the distance across the river, then at the dog who was pretending to be in earnest about biting him, and then at his bare feet, which he placed with pleasure in various positions, moving his dirty, thick, big toes. Every time he looked at his bare feet, a smile of animated self-satisfaction flitted across his face. The sight of them reminded him of all he had experienced and learned during these weeks, and this recollection was pleasant to him. For some days the weather had been calm and clear, with slight frosts in the morning, what is called an old wives' summer. In the sunshine the air was warm, and that warmth was particularly pleasant with the invigorating freshness of the morning frost still in the air. On everything far and near lay the magic crystal glitter seen only at that time of autumn. The sparrow hills were visible in the distance with the village, the church, and the large white house. The bare trees, the sand, the bricks and roofs of the houses, the green church spire, and the corner of the white house in the distance all stood out in the transparent air in most delicate outline and with unnatural clearness. Nearby could be seen the familiar ruins of a half-burned mansion occupied by the French, with lilac bushes still showing dark green beside the fence. And even that ruined and befouled house, which in dull weather was repulsively ugly, seemed quietly beautiful now in the clear, motionless brilliance. A French corporal, with coat unbuttoned in a homely way, a skullcap on his head, and a short pipe in his mouth, came from behind a corner of the shed and approached Pierre with a friendly wink. What sunshine, Monsieur Quirot, their name for Peter. Eh, just like spring. And the corporal leaned against the door and offered Pierre his pipe, though whenever he offered it, Pierre always declined it. To be on the march in such weather, he began. Pierre inquired what was being said about leaving, and the corporal told him that nearly all the troops were starting, and there ought to be an order about the prisoners that day. Sokolov, one of the soldiers in the shed with Pierre, was dying, and Pierre told the corporal that something should be done about him. The corporal replied that Pierre need not worry about that as they had an ambulance and a permanent hospital and arrangements would be made for the sick, 
and that in general, everything that could happen had been foreseen by the authorities. Besides, Monsieur Kiro, you have only to say a word to the captain, you know. He is a man who never forgets anything. Speak to the captain when he makes his round. He will do anything for you. The captain, of whom the corporal spoke, often had long chats with Pierre and showed him all sorts of favors. You see, St. Thomas, he said to me the other day, Monsieur Kirill is a man of education who speaks French. He is a Russian seigneur who has had misfortunes, but he is a man. He knows what's what. If he wants anything and asks me, he won't get a refusal. When one has studied, you see, one likes education and well-bred people. It is for your sake I mention it, Monsieur Kirill. The other day, if it had not been for you, that affair would have ended ill. And after chatting a while longer, the corporal went away. The affair he had alluded to had happened a few days before. A fight between the prisoners and the French soldiers, in which Pierre had succeeded in pacifying his comrades. Some of the prisoners who had heard Pierre talking to the corporal immediately asked what the Frenchman had said. While Pierre was repeating what he had been told about the army leaving Moscow, a thin, sallow, tattered French soldier came up to the door of the shed. Rapidly and timidly raising his fingers to his forehead by way of greeting, he asked Pierre whether the soldier Platoche to whom he had given a shirt to sew was in that shed. A week before the French had had boot leather and linen issued to them, which they had given out to the prisoners to make up into boots and shirts for them. "'Ready, ready, dear fellow,' said Karatayev, coming out with a neatly folded shirt. Karatayev, on account of the warm weather and for convenience at work, was wearing only trousers and a tattered shirt as black as soot. His hair was bound round, workman fashion, with a wisp of lime-tree bast, and his round face seemed rounder and pleasanter than ever. A promise, his own brother to performance. I said Friday, and here it is, ready, said Platon, smiling and unfolding the shirt he had sewn. The Frenchman glanced around uneasily, and then, as if overcoming his hesitation, rapidly threw off his uniform and put on the shirt. He had a long, greasy, flowered silk waistcoat next to his sallow, thin, bare body, but no shirt. He was evidently afraid the prisoners looking on would laugh at him, and thrust his head into the shirt hurriedly. None of the prisoners said a word. "'See, it fits well,' Platon kept repeating, pulling the shirt straight. The Frenchman, having pushed his head and hands through without raising his eyes, looked down at the shirt and examined the seams. "'You see, dear man, this is not a sewing shop, and I had no proper tools, and, as they say, one needs a tool even to kill a louse,' said Platon with one of his round smiles, obviously pleased with his work. "'It's good, quite good. Thank you,' said the Frenchman, in French. "'But there must be some linen left over.' "'It will fit better still when it sets to your body,' said Karatayev, still admiring his handiwork. "'You'll be nice and comfortable.' "'Thanks, thanks, old fellow. But the bits left over?' said the Frenchman again, and smiled. He took out an assignation ruble note and gave it to Karatayev. "'But give me the pieces that are over.' Pierre saw that Platon did not want to understand what the Frenchman was saying, and he looked on without interfering. Karatayev thanked the Frenchman for the money and went on admiring his own work. The Frenchman insisted on having the pieces returned that were left over and asked Pierre to translate what he said. "'What does he want the bits for?' said Karatayev. "'They'd make fine leg bands for us. Well, never mind.' And Karatayev with a suddenly changed and saddened expression, took a small bundle of scraps from inside his shirt and gave it to the Frenchman without looking at him. "'Oh, dear,' muttered Karatayev and went away. The Frenchman looked at the linen, considered for a moment, then looked inquiringly at Pierre, and, as if Pierre's look had told him something, suddenly blushed and shouted in a squeaky voice. Platoche! "'Hey, Platoche, keep them yourself!' And handing back the odd bits, he turned and went out. "'There, look at that,' 
said Karatayev, swaying his head. People said they were not Christians, but they too have souls. It's what the old folk used to say. A sweating hand's an open hand, a dry hand's close. He's naked, but yet he's given it back. Karatayev smiled thoughtfully and was silent a while looking at the pieces. But they'll make grand leg bands, dear friend, he said and went back into the shed. End of section 11. Recording by Miriam Esther Goldman. War and Peace, Book 13, Chapter 12. Read for LibriVox by Ernst Patinama. Four weeks had passed since Pierre had been taken prisoner, and though the French had offered to move him from the men's to the officer's shed, he had stayed in the shed where he was first put. In burned and devastated Moscow, Pierre experienced almost the extreme limits of privation a man can endure. But thanks to his physical strength and health, of which he had till then been unconscious, and thanks especially to the fact that the privations came so gradually that it was impossible to say when they began, he endured his position not only lightly, but joyfully. And just at this time he obtained the tranquillity and ease of mind he had formerly striven in vain to reach. He had long sought in different ways that tranquillity of mind, that inner harmony which had so impressed him in the soldiers at the Battle of Borodino. He had sought it in philanthropy, in Freemasonry, in the dissipations of town life, in wine, in heroic feats of self-sacrifice, and in romantic love for Natasha. He had sought it by reasoning, and all these quests and experiments had failed him. And now, without thinking about it, he had found that peace and inner harmony, only through the horror of death, through privation, and through what he recognized in Karataev. Those dreadful moments he had lived through at the executions had, as it were, forever washed away from his imagination and memory the agitating thoughts and feelings that had formerly seemed so important. It did not now occur to him to think of Russia, or the war, or politics, or Napoleon. It was plain to him that all these things were no business of his, and that he was not called on to judge concerning them, and therefore could not do so. Russia and summer weather are not bound together, he thought, repeating words of Karataev's, which he found strangely consoling. His intention of killing Napoleon and his calculations of the cabalistic number of the beast of the apocalypse now seemed to him meaningless and even ridiculous. His anger with his wife and anxiety that his name should not be smirched now seemed not merely trivial but even amusing. What concern was it of his that, somewhere or other, that woman was leading the life she preferred? What did it matter to anybody, and especially to him, whether or not they found out that their prisoner's name was Count Bezukhov? He now often remembered his conversation with Prince Andrew, and quite agreed with him, though he understood Prince Andrew's thoughts somewhat differently. Prince Andrew had thought and said, that happiness could only be negative, but had said it with a shade of bitterness and irony, as though he was really saying that all desire for positive happiness is implanted in us merely to torment us and never be satisfied. But Pierre believed it without any mental reservation. The absence of suffering, the satisfaction of one's needs and consequent freedom in the choice of one's occupation, that is, of one's way of life, now seemed to Pierre to be indubitably man's highest happiness. Here and now, for the first time, he fully appreciated the enjoyment of eating when he wanted to eat, drinking when he wanted to drink, sleeping when he wanted to sleep, of warmth when he was cold, of talking to a fellow man when he wished to talk, and to hear a human voice. The satisfaction of one's needs, good food, cleanliness and freedom, 
now that he was deprived of all this, seemed to Pierre to constitute perfect happiness, and the choice of occupation, that is, of his way of life, now that that was so restricted, seemed to him such an easy matter that he forgot that the superfluity of the comforts of life destroys all joy in satisfying one's needs, while great freedom in the choice of occupation, such freedom as his wealth, his education, and his social position, had given him in his own life, is just what makes the choice of occupation insolubly difficult and destroys the desire and possibility of having an occupation. All Pierre's daydreams now turned on the time when he would be free. Yet subsequently, and for the rest of his life, he thought and spoke with enthusiasm of that month of captivity, of those irrecoverable, strong, joyful sensations, and chiefly of the complete peace of mind and inner freedom which he experienced only during those weeks. When on the first day he got up early, went out of the shed at dawn, and saw the cupolas and crosses of the new convent of the Virgin, still dark at first, the hoar-frost and the dusty grass, the sparrow hills, and the wooded banks above the winding river, vanishing in the purple distance, when he felt the contact of the fresh air, and heard the noise of the crows flying from Moscow across the field, and when afterwards light gleamed from the east, and the sun's rim appeared solemnly from behind a cloud, and the cupolas and crosses, the hoar-frost, the distance, and the river, all began to sparkle in the glad light, Pierre felt a new joy and strength in life, such as he had never before known. And this not only stayed with him during the whole of his imprisonment, but even grew in strength as the hardships of his position increased. That feeling of alertness and of readiness for anything was still further strengthened in him by the high opinion his fellow prisoners formed of him soon after his arrival at the shed. With his knowledge of languages, the respect shown him by the French, his simplicity, his readiness to give anything asked of him, he received the allowance of three rubles a week made to officers. With his strength, which he showed to the soldiers by pressing nails into the walls of his hut, his gentleness to his companions, and his capacity for sitting still and thinking without doing anything, which seemed to them incomprehensible, he appeared to them a rather mysterious and superior being. The very qualities that had been a hindrance, if not actually harmful, to him and the world he had lived in, his strength his disdain for the comforts of life, his absent-mindedness and simplicity, here among these peoples, gave him almost the status of a hero, and Pierre felt that their opinion placed responsibilities upon him. End of War and Peace, Book 13, Chapter 12 Read by Ernst Patinama Book Thirteen, Chapter Thirteen, read for LibriVox by Ernst Patinama. The French evacuation began on the night between the sixth and seventh of October. Kitchens and sheds were dismantled, carts loaded, and troops and baggage trains started. At seven in the morning, a French convoy in marching trim, wearing shakos and carrying muskets, knapsacks, and enormous sacks stood in front of the sheds, and animated French talk mingled with curses sounded all along the lines. In the shed everyone was ready, dressed, belted, shod, and only awaited the order to start. The sick soldier, Sokolov, pale and thin with dark shadows round his eyes, alone sat in his place barefoot and not dressed. His eyes, prominent from the emaciation of his face, gazed inquiringly at his comrades, who were paying no attention to him, and he moaned regularly and quietly. It was evidently not so much his sufferings that caused him to moan, he had dysentery, as his fear and grief at being left alone. Pierre, girt with a rope round his waist, 
and wearing shoes Karatayev had made for him from some leather a French soldier had torn off a tea chest and brought to have his boots mended with, went up to the sick man and squatted down beside him. You know, Sokolov, they are not all going away. They have a hospital here. You may be better off than we others, said Pierre. Oh, Lord! Oh, it will be the death of me! Oh, Lord! moaned the man in a louder voice. I'll go and ask them again directly, said Pierre, rising and going to the door of the shed. Just as Pierre reached the door, the corporal who had offered him a pipe the day before came up to it with two soldiers. The corporal and soldiers were in marching kit with knapsacks and shakos that had metal straps, and these changed their familiar faces. The corporal came, according to orders, to shut the door. The prisoners had to be counted before being let out. Corporal, what will they do with the sick man? Pierre began. But even as he spoke, he began to doubt whether this was the corporal he knew, or a stranger, so unlike himself did the corporal seem at that moment. Moreover, just as Pierre was speaking, a sharp rattle of drums was suddenly heard from both sides. The corporal frowned at Pierre's words and, uttering some meaningless oaths, slammed the door. The shed became semi-dark, and the sharp rattle of the drums on two sides drowned the sick man's groans. "'There it is. It again,' said Pierre to himself, and an involuntary shudder ran down his spine. In the corporal's changed face, in the sound of his voice, in the stirring and deafening noise of the drums, he recognized that mysterious, callous force which compelled people against a will to kill their fellow men, that force, the effect of which he had witnessed during the executions. To fear or to try to escape that force, to address entreaties or exhortations to those who served as its tools, was useless. Pierre knew this now. One had to wait and endure. He did not again go to the sick man, nor turn to look at him but stood frowning by the door of the hut. When the door was opened, and the prisoners, crowding against one another like a flock of sheep, squeezed into the exit, Pierre pushed his way forward, and approached that very captain who, as the corporal had assured him, was ready to do anything for him. The captain was also in marching kit, and on his cold face appeared that same it, which Pierre had recognized in the corporal's words and in the roll of the drums. Pass on, pass on, the captain reiterated, frowning sternly, and looking at the prisoners who thronged past him. Pierre went up to him, though he knew his attempt would be vain. What now? the officer asked with a cold look, as if not recognizing Pierre. Pierre told him about the sick man. He'll manage to walk, devil take him, said the captain. Pass on, pass on, he continued, without looking at Pierre. But he is dying, Pierre again began. Be so good, shouted the captain, frowning angrily. Drum, da da dum, 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 rattled the drums, and Pierre understood that this mysterious force completely controlled these men, and that it was now useless to say any more. The officer prisoners were separated from the soldiers and told to march in front. There were about thirty officers, with Pierre among them, and about three hundred men. The officers, who had come from the other sheds, were all strangers to Pierre, and much better dressed than he. They looked at him and at his shoes mistrustfully, as at an alien, not far from him walked a fat major with a sallow, bloated, angry face, who was wearing a kazan dressing-gown tied round with a towel, and who evidently enjoyed the respect of his fellow prisoners. He kept one hand, in which he clasped his tobacco pouch, inside the bosom of his dressing-gown, and held the stem of his pipe firmly with the other. Panting and puffing, the major grumbled and growled at everybody, 
because he thought he was being pushed and that they were all hurrying when they had nowhere to hurry to and were all surprised at something when there was nothing to be surprised at another a thin little officer was speaking to everyone conjecturing where they were now being taken and how far they would get that day an official in felt boots and wearing a commissariat uniform ran round from side to side and gazed at the ruins of moscow loudly announcing his observations as to what had been burned down and what this or that part of the city was that they could see a third officer who by his accent was a pole disputed with the commissariat officer arguing that he was mistaken in his identification of the different wards of moscow what are you disputing about said the major angrily what does it matter whether it is st nicholas or st blasius you see it's burned down and there's an end of it what are you pushing for isn't the road wide enough said he turning to a man behind him who was not pushing him at all oh 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 what have they done the prisoners on one side and another were heard saying as they gazed on the charred ruins all beyond the river and zubova and the kremlin just look there's not half of it left yes i told you the whole quarter beyond the river and so it is well you know it's burnt so what's the use of talking said the major as they passed near a church in a Khamovniki, one of the few unburnt quarters of moscow the whole mass of prisoners suddenly started to one side and exclamations of horror and disgust were heard ah oh, the villains what heathens yes dead dead so he is and smeared with something pierre too drew near the church where the thing was that evoked these exclamations and dimly met out something leaning against the palings surrounding the church from the words of his comrades who saw better than he did he found that this was a body of a man set upright against the palings with its face smeared with soot go on what the devil go on thirty thousand devils the convoy guards began cursing and the french soldiers with fresh virulence drove away with their swords the crowd of prisoners who were gazing at the dead man end of chapter thirteen recorded by ernst patinama Thirteen, Chapter Fourteen. Read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon. Through the cross streets of the Khamovniki quarter, the prisoners marched, followed only by their escort and the vehicles and wagons belonging to that escort. But when they reached the supply stores, they came among a huge and closely packed train of artillery mingled with private vehicles. At the bridge, they all halted, waiting for those in front to get across. From the bridge they had a view of endless lines of moving baggage trains before and behind them. To the right, where the Kaluga road turns near Neshkuchny, endless rows of troops and carts stretched away into the distance. These were troops of Bohanes Kool, which had started before any of the others. Behind, along the riverside and across the stone bridge, were Ney's troops and transport, Davao's troops, in whose charge were the prisoners, were crossing the Crimean bridge, and some were already debouching into the Kaluga road. But the baggage trains stretched out so that the last of Bohanes' train had not yet got out of Moscow and reached the Kaluga road, when the vanguard of Ney's army was already emerging from the great Ordinka street. When they had crossed the Crimean bridge, the prisoners moved a few steps forward, halted, and again moved on, and from all sides vehicles and men crowded closer and closer together. They advanced the few hundred paces that separated the bridge from the Kaluga road, taking more than an hour to do so, and came out upon the square where the streets of the Transmovskva ward and the Kaluga road converge, and the prisoners, jammed close together, had to stand for some hours at that crossway. From all sides, like the roar of the sea, were heard the rattle of wheels, the tramp of feet, and incessant shouts of anger and abuse. Pierre stood pressed against the wall of a charred house, listening to that noise, which mingled in his imagination with the roll of the drums. 
To get a better view, several officer prisoners climbed onto the wall of the half-burned house against which Pierre was leaning. "'What crowds! Just look at the crowds! They've loaded goods even on the cannon! Look there! Those are furs!' they exclaimed. "'Just see what the blackguards have looted! There! See what that one has behind in the cart! Why, those are settings taken from some icons, by heaven! Oh, the rascals! See how that fellow has loaded himself up! He can hardly walk! Good Lord, they've even grabbed those chases! See that fellow there, sitting on the trunks! Heavens! They're fighting! That's right, hit him on the snout! On his snout! Like this, we shan't get away before evening! Look, look there! Why, that must be Napoleon's own! See what horses! And the monograms with a crown! It's like a portable house! That fellow's dropped his sack and doesn't see it! Fighting again! A woman with a baby, and not bad-looking either. Yes, I dare say, that's the way they'll let you pass. Just look, there's no end to it. Russian wenches, by heaven, so they are. In carriages, see how comfortably they've settled themselves. Again, as at the church in Kamovniki, a wave of general curiosity bore all the prisoners forward onto the road, and Pierre, thanks to his stature, saw over the heads of the others what so attracted their curiosity. In three carriages involved among the munition carts, closely squeezed together, sat women with rouged faces, dressed in glaring colours, who were shouting something in shrill voices. From the moment Pierre had recognised the appearance of the mysterious force, nothing had seemed to him strange or dreadful. Neither the corpse smeared with soot for fun, nor these women hurrying away, nor the burned ruins of Moscow. All that he now witnessed scarcely made an impression on him as if his soul, making ready for a hard struggle, refused to receive impressions that might weaken it. The women's vehicles drove by. Behind them came more carts, soldiers, wagons, soldiers, gun carriages, carriages, soldiers, ammunition carts, more soldiers, and now and then women. Pierre did not see the people as individuals, but saw their movement. All these people and horses seemed driven forward by some invisible power. During the hour Pierre watched them, they all came flowing from the different streets with one and the same desire to get on quickly. They all jostled one another, began to grow angry and to fight. White teeth gleamed, brows frowned, ever the same words of abuse flew from side to side, and all the faces bore the same swaggeringly resolute and coldly cruel expression that had struck Pierre that morning on the corporal's face when the drums were beating. It was not till nearly evening that the officer commanding the escort collected his men, and with shouts and quarrels forced his way in among the baggage trains, and the prisoners, hemmed in on all sides, emerged on to the Kaluga road. They marched very quickly, without resting, and halted only when the sun began to set. The baggage carts drew up close together, and the men began to prepare for their night's rest. They all appeared angry and dissatisfied. For a long time oaths, angry shouts, and fighting could be heard from all sides. A carriage that followed the escort ran into one of the carts and knocked a hole in it with its pole. Several soldiers ran toward the cart from different sides. Some beat the carriage horses on their heads, turning them aside, Others fought among themselves, and Pierre saw that one German was badly wounded on the head by a sword. It seemed that all these men, now that they had stopped amid fields in the chill dusk of the autumn evening, experienced one and the same feeling of unpleasant awakening from the hurry and eagerness to push on that had seized them at the start. Once at a standstill, they all seemed to understand that they did not yet know where they were going, and that much that was painful and difficult awaited them on this journey. During this halt the escort treated the prisoners even worse than they had done at the start. It was here that the prisoners for the first time received horse-flesh for their meat ration. From the officer down to the lowest soldier they showed what seemed like personal spite against each of the prisoners, in unexpected contrast to their former friendly relations. This spite increased still more when, on calling over the roll of prisoners, it was found that in the bustle of leaving Moscow one Russian soldier, who had pretended to suffer from colic, had escaped. Pierre saw a Frenchman beat a Russian soldier cruelly for straying too far from the road, 
and heard his friend the captain reprimand and threaten to court-martial a non-commissioned officer on account of the escape of the Russian. To the non-commissioned officer's excuse that the prisoner was ill and could not walk, the officer replied that the order was to shoot those who lagged behind. Pierre felt that that fatal force which had crushed him during the executions, but which he had not felt during his imprisonment, now again controlled his existence. It was terrible, but he felt that in proportion to the efforts of that fatal force to crush him, there grew and strengthened in his soul a power of life independent of it. He ate his supper of buckwheat soup with horse flesh and chatted with his comrades. Neither Pierre nor any of the others spoke of what they had seen in Moscow, or of the roughness of their treatment by the French, or of the order to shoot them which had been announced to them. As if in reaction against the worsening of their position, they were all particularly animated and gay. They spoke of personal reminiscences, of amusing scenes they had witnessed during the campaign, and avoided all talk of their present situation. The sun had set long since. Bright stars shone out here and there in the sky. A red glow as of a conflagration spread above the horizon from the rising full moon, and that vast red ball swayed strangely in the grey haze. It grew light. The evening was ending, but the night had not yet come. Pierre got up and left his new companions, crossing between the campfires to the other side of the road where he had been told the common soldier prisoners were stationed. He wanted to talk to them. On the road he was stopped by a French sentinel who ordered him back. Pierre turned back, not to his companions by the campfire, but to an unharnessed cart where there was nobody. Tucking his legs under him and dropping his head, he sat down on the cold ground by the wheel of the cart, and remained motionless a long while, sunk in thought. Suddenly he burst out into a fit of his broad, good-natured laughter, so loud that men from various sides turned with surprise to see what this strange and evidently solitary laughter could mean. Ha! 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 laughed Pierre, and he said aloud to himself, "'The soldier did not let me pass. They took me and shut me up. They hold me captive.' "'What? Me? Me? My immortal soul? Ha! 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 And he laughed till tears started to his eyes. A man got up and came to see what this queer big fellow was laughing at, all by himself. Pierre stopped laughing, got up, went farther away from the inquisitive man, and looked around him. The huge, endless bivouac that had previously resounded with the crackling of campfires and the voices of many men had grown quiet, the red campfires were growing paler and dying down. High up in the light sky hung the full moon. Forests and fields beyond the camp, unseen before, were now visible in the distance, and farther still, beyond those forests and fields, the bright, oscillating, limitless distance lured one to itself. Pierre glanced up at the sky and the twinkling stars in its faraway depths. And all that is me, all that is within me, and it is all I, thought Pierre. And they caught all that and put it into a shed boarded up with planks. He smiled and went and lay down to sleep beside his companions. End of chapter 14《『Book Thirteen』Chapter Fifteen Read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon In the early days of October, another envoy came to Kutuzov with a letter from Napoleon proposing peace and falsely dated from Moscow, though Napoleon was already not far from Kutuzov on the old Kaluga road. Kutuzov replied to this letter as he had done to the one formerly brought by Lauriston, saying that there could be no question of peace. Soon after that, a report was received from Dorokov's guerrilla detachment operating to the left of Tarotino that troops of Broussier's division had been seen at Farminsk, and that being separated from the rest of the French army, they might easily be destroyed. The soldiers and officers again demanded action. Generals on the staff, excited by the memory of the easy victory at Tarotino, urged Kutuzov to carry out Dorokov's suggestion. Kutuzov did not consider any offensive necessary. The result was a compromise which was inevitable. A small detachment was sent to Farminsk to attack Broussier. 
by a strange coincidence this task, which turned out to be a most difficult and important one, was entrusted to Doktorov, that same modest little Doktorov whom no one had described to us as drawing up plans of battles, dashing about in front of regiments, showering crosses on batteries and so on, and who was thought to be, and was spoken of, as undecided and undiscerning, but whom we find commanding wherever the position was most difficult all through the Russo-French wars from Austerlitz to the year 1813. At Austerlitz he remained last at the August Dam, rallying the regiments, saving what was possible when all were flying and perishing, and not a single general was left in the rear guard. Ill with fever, he went to Smolensk with twenty thousand men to defend the town against Napoleon's whole army. In Smolensk, at the Malakov Gate, he had hardly dozed off in a paroxysm of fever before he was awakened by the bombardment of the town, and Smolensk held out all day long. At the Battle of Borodino, when Bagration was killed, and nine-tenths of the men of our left flank had fallen, and the full force of the French artillery fire was directed against it, the man sent there was this same irresolute and undiscerning Doktorov. Kutuzov hastening to rectify a mistake he had made by sending someone else there first. And the quiet little Doktorov rode thither, and Borodino became the greatest glory of the Russian army. Many heroes have been described to us in verse and prose, but of Doktorov scarcely a word has been said. It was Doktorov again whom they sent to Forminsk, and from there to Malo Yaroslavets, the place where the last battle with the French was fought, and where the obvious disintegration of the French army began, and we are told of many geniuses and heroes of that period of the campaign, but of Doktorov nothing or very little is said, and that dubiously, and this silence about Doktorov is the clearest testimony to his merit. It is natural for a man who does not understand the workings of a machine to imagine that a shaving that has fallen into it by chance and is interfering with its action and tossing about in it is its most important part. The man who does not understand the construction of the machine cannot conceive that the small connecting cogwheel which revolves quietly is one of the most essential parts of the machine, and not the shaving which merely harms and hinders the working. On the 10th of October, when Doktorov had gone halfway to Forminsk and stopped at the village of Aristovo, preparing faithfully to execute the orders he had received, the whole French army having, in its convulsive movement, reached Murat's position, apparently in order to give battle, suddenly, without any reason, turned off to the left onto the new Kaluga road, and began to enter Forminsk, where only Broussier had been till then. At that time, Doktorov had under his command, besides Dorkov's detachment, the two small guerrilla detachments of Fignet and Seslavin. On the evening of October 11, Seslavin came to the Aristovo headquarters with a French guardsman he had captured. The prisoner said that the troops that had entered Forminsk that day were the vanguard of the whole army, that Napoleon was there, and the whole army had left Moscow four days previously. That same evening, a house serf who had come from Borovsk said he had seen an immense army entering the town. Some Cossacks of Doktorov's detachment reported having sighted the French guards marching along the road to Borovsk. From all these reports it was evident that where they had expected to meet a single division, there was now the whole French army marching from Moscow in an unexpected direction along the Kaluga road. Doktorov was unwilling to undertake any action, as it was not clear to him now what he ought to do. He had been ordered to attack Forminsk, but only Bruchet had been there at that time, and now the whole French army was there. Ermolov wished to act on his own judgment, but Doktorov insisted that he must have Kutuzov's instructions. So it was decided to send a dispatch to the staff. For this purpose, a capable officer, Bolkovitinov, was chosen, who was to explain the whole affair by word of mouth, besides delivering a written report. Toward midnight, Bolkovitinov, having received the dispatch and verbal instructions, galloped off to the general staff, accompanied by a Cossack with spare horses. End of chapter 15 This recording is in the public domain. Book 13, Chapter 16 Read for LibriVox.org by Laurie Ann Walden 
It was a warm, dark autumn night. It had been raining for four days. Having changed horses twice, and galloped twenty miles in an hour and a half over a sticky, muddy road, Bolkovitinov reached Lidoshevka after one o'clock at night. Dismounting at a cottage on whose wattle fence hung a signboard, General Staff, and throwing down his reins, he entered a dark passage. "'The general on duty, quick, it's very important,' said he to someone who had risen and was sniffing in the dark passage. He has been very unwell since the evening, and this is the third night he has not slept, said the orderly, pleadingly in a whisper. You should wake the captain first. But this is very important from General Doktorov, said Bolkovitinov, entering the open door which he had found by feeling in the dark. The orderly had gone in before him and began waking somebody. Your honor, your honor, a courier. "'What? What's that? From whom?' came a sleepy voice. "'From Doktorov and from Alexey Petrovitch. Napoleon is at Formensk,' said Bolkovitinov, unable to see in the dark who was speaking, but guessing by the voice that it was not Konovnitsyn. The man who had wakened yawned and stretched himself. "'I don't like waking him,' he said, fumbling for something. "'He is very ill.' Perhaps this is only a rumor. Here is the dispatch, said Bolkovitinov. My orders are to give it at once to the general on duty. Wait a moment, I'll light a candle. You damned rascal, where do you always hide it? said the voice of the man who was stretching himself to the orderly. This was Cherbinin, Konovnitsyn's adjutant. I found it, I found it, he added. The orderly was striking a light, and Scherbinin was fumbling for something on the candlestick. "'Oh, the nasty beasts!' said he with disgust. By the light of the sparks, Bolkovitinov saw Scherbinin's youthful face as he held the candle, and the face of another man who was still asleep. This was Konovnitsyn. When the flame of the sulfur splinters kindled by the tinder burned up, first blue and then red, Scherbinin lit the tallow candle, from the candlestick of which the cockroaches that had been gnawing it were running away, and looked at the messenger. Bolkovitinov was bespattered all over with mud, and had smeared his face by wiping it with his sleeve. "'Who gave the report?' inquired Scherbinin, taking the envelope. "'The news is reliable,' said Bolkovitinov. "'Prisoners, Cossacks, and the scouts all say the same thing.' "'There's nothing to be done. We'll have to wake him,' says Cherbinin, rising and going up to the man in the nightcap, who lay covered by a greatcoat. "'Peter Petrovitch,' said he. Konovnitsyn did not stir. "'To the general staff,' he said with a smile, knowing that those words would be sure to arouse him. And in fact the head in the nightcap was lifted at once. On Konovnitsyn's handsome, resolute face, with cheeks flushed by fever, there still remained for an instant a far-away, dreamy expression, remote from present affairs. But then he suddenly started, and his face assumed its habitual calm and firm appearance. "'Well, what is it? From whom?' he asked immediately, but without hurry, blinking at the light. While listening to the officer's report, Konovnitsyn broke the seal and read the dispatch. Hardly had he done so before he lowered his legs in their woolen stockings to the earthen floor and began putting on his boots. Then he took off his nightcap, combed his hair over his temples, and donned his cap. "'Did you get here quickly? Let us go to his highness.' Konovnitsyn had understood at once that the news brought was of great importance and that no time must be lost. He did not consider or ask himself whether the news was good or bad." That did not interest him. He regarded the whole business of the war not with his intelligence or his reason, but by something else. There was within him a deep, unexpressed conviction that all would be well, but that one must not trust to this, and still less speak about it, but must only attend to one's own work. And he did his work, giving his whole strength to the task. Peter Petrovich Konovnitsyn, like Doktorov, seems to have been included merely for propriety's sake on the list of the so-called heroes of 1812, 
the Barclays, Revskys, Ermolovs, Platovs, and Miloradoviches. Like Doktorov, he had the reputation of being a man of very limited capacity and information, and, like Doktorov, he never made plans of battle, but was always found where the situation was most difficult. Since his appointment as general on duty, he had always slept with his door open, giving orders that every messenger should be allowed to wake him up. In battle he was always under fire, so that Kutuzov reproved him for it, and feared to send him to the front. And, like Doktorov, he was one of those unnoticed cog-wheels that, without clatter or noise, constitute the most essential part of the machine. Coming out of the hut into the damp, dark night, Konovnitsyn frowned, partly from an increased pain in his head, and partly at the unpleasant thought that occurred to him of how all that nest of influential men on the staff would be stirred up by this news, especially Bennigsen, who ever since Tarantino had been at daggers drawn with Kutuzov, and how they would make suggestions, quarrel, issue orders, and rescind them. And this premonition was disagreeable to him, though he knew it could not be helped. And in fact, Tall, to whom he went to communicate the news, immediately began to expound his plans to a general sharing his quarters, until Konovnitsyn, who listened in weary silence, reminded him that they must go to see His Highness. End of chapter 16. This recording is in the public domain. Book 13, Chapter 17. Read for LibriVox.org by Laurie Ann Walden. Kutuzov, like all old people, did not sleep much at night. He often fell asleep unexpectedly in the daytime, but at night, lying on his bed without undressing, he generally remained awake, thinking. So he lay now on his bed, supporting his large, heavy, scarred head on his plump hand, with his one eye open, meditating and peering into the darkness. Since Bennigsen, who corresponded with the emperor, and had more influence than anyone else on the staff, had begun to avoid him, Kutuzov was more at ease as to the possibility of himself and his troops being obliged to take part in useless, aggressive movements. The lesson of the Tarantino battle, and of the day before it, which Kutuzov remembered with pain, must, he thought, have some effect on others, too. They must understand that we can only lose by taking the offensive. Patience and time are my warriors, my champions, thought Kutuzov. He knew that an apple should not be plucked while it is green. It will fall of itself when ripe, but if picked unripe, the apple is spoiled, the tree is harmed, and your teeth are set on edge. Like an experienced sportsman, he knew that the beast was wounded, and wounded as only the whole strength of Russia could have wounded it. But whether it was mortally wounded or not was still an undecided question. Now, by the fact of Lauriston and Barthelemy having been sent, and by the reports of the guerrillas, Kutuzov was almost sure that the wound was mortal. But he needed further proofs, and it was necessary to wait. They want to see how they have wounded it. Wait and we shall see. Continual maneuvers, continual advances, thought he. What for? Only to distinguish themselves, as if fighting were fun. They are like children from whom one can't get any sensible account of what has happened, because they all want to show how well they can fight. But that's not what is needed now. And what ingenious maneuvers they all propose to me. It seems to them that when they have thought of two or three contingencies, he remembered the general plan sent him from Petersburg. They have foreseen everything, but the contingencies are endless. The undecided question as to whether the wound inflicted at Borodino was mortal or not had hung over Kutuzov's head for a whole month. On the one hand, the French had occupied Moscow. On the other, Kutuzov felt assured with all his being that the terrible blow into which he and all the Russians had put their whole strength must have been mortal. But in any case, proofs were needed. He had waited a whole month for them, and grew more impatient the longer he waited. Lying on his bed during those sleepless nights, he did just what he reproached those younger generals for doing. He imagined all sorts of possible contingencies, just like the younger men, but with this difference, that he saw thousands of contingencies instead of two or three, 
and based nothing on them. The longer he thought, the more contingencies presented themselves. He imagined all sorts of movements of the Napoleonic army, as a whole or in sections, against Petersburg, or against him, or to outflank him. He thought, too, of the possibility, which he feared most of all, that Napoleon might fight him with his own weapon and remain in Moscow awaiting him. Kutuzov even imagined that Napoleon's army might turn back through Medin and Yuknov, but the one thing he could not foresee was what happened, the insane convulsive stampede of Napoleon's army during its first eleven days after leaving Moscow, a stampede which made possible what Kutuzov had not yet even dared to think of, the complete extermination of the French. Dorokhov's report about Broussier's division, the guerrillas' reports of distress in Napoleon's army, rumors of preparations for leaving Moscow, all confirmed the supposition that the French army was beaten and preparing for flight. But these were only suppositions, which seemed important to the younger men, but not to Kutuzov. With his sixty years' experience, he knew what value to attach to rumors, knew how apt people who desire anything are to group all news so that it appears to confirm what they desire and he knew how readily in such cases they omit all that makes for the contrary. And the more he desired it, the less he allowed himself to believe it. This question absorbed all his mental powers. All else was to him only life's customary routine. To such customary routine belonged his conversations with the staff, the letters he wrote from Tarantino to Madame de Stael, the reading of novels, the distribution of awards, his correspondence with Petersburg, and so on. But the destruction of the French, which he alone foresaw, was his heart's one desire. On the night of the 11th of October he lay leaning on his arm and thinking of that. There was a stir in the next room, and he heard the steps of Toll, Konovnitsyn, and Bolkovitinov. "'Eh? Who's there? Come in, come in. What news?' the field marshal called out to them. While a footman was lighting a candle, Tull communicated the substance of the news. "'Who brought it?' asked Kutuzov, with a look which, when the candle was lit, struck Tull by its cold severity. "'There can be no doubt about it, Your Highness.' "'Call him in. Call him here.' Kutuzov sat up with one leg hanging down from his bed, and his big paunch resting against the other, which was doubled under him. He screwed up his seeing eye to scrutinize the messenger more carefully, as if wishing to read in his face what preoccupied his own mind. "'Tell me, tell me, friend,' said he to Bolkovitinov, in his low, aged voice, as he pulled together the shirt which gaped open on his chest. "'Come nearer, nearer. "'What news have you brought me, eh? "'That Napoleon has left Moscow? "'Are you sure, eh?' Bolkovitinov gave a detailed account from the beginning of all he had been told to report. "'Speak quicker, quicker. Don't torture me,' Kutuzov interrupted him. Bolkovitinov told him everything, and was then silent, awaiting instructions. Toll was beginning to say something, but Kutuzov checked him. He tried to say something, but his face suddenly puckered and wrinkled. He waved his arm at Toll and turned to the opposite side of the room, to the corner darkened by the icons that hung there. "'O oh Lord, my Creator, Thou hast heard our prayer,' said he in a tremulous voice with folded hands. "'Russia is saved. I thank Thee, O oh Lord.' And he wept. End of chapter 17 This recording is in the public domain. Piece, Book Thirteen, Chapter Eighteen, read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon. From the time he received this news to the end of the campaign, all Kutuzov's activity was directed toward restraining his troops, by authority, by guile, and by entreaty, from useless attacks, manoeuvres, or encounters with the perishing enemy. Dokhtarov went to Maloyaroslavets, but Kutuzov lingered with the main army and gave orders for the evacuation of Kaluga a retreat beyond which town seemed to him quite possible. Everywhere Kutuzov retreated, but the enemy, without waiting for his retreat, fled in the opposite direction. 
Napoleon's historians describe to us his skilled manoeuvres at Tarotino and Malo Yaroslavitz, and make conjectures as to what would have happened had Napoleon been in time to penetrate into the rich southern provinces. But not to speak of the fact that nothing prevented him from advancing into those southern provinces, for the Russian army did not bar his way, the historians forget that nothing could have saved his army, for then already it bore within itself the germs of inevitable ruin. How could that army, which had found abundant supplies in Moscow and had trampled them underfoot instead of keeping them, and, on arriving at Smolensk, had looted provisions instead of storing them, how could that army recuperate in Kaluga province, which was inhabited by Russians such as those who lived in Moscow, and where fire had the same property of consuming what was set ablaze? That army could not recover anywhere. Since the Battle of Borodino and the pillage of Moscow, it had borne within itself, as it were, the chemical elements of dissolution. The members of what had once been an army, Napoleon himself and all his soldiers fled, without knowing whither, each concerned only to make his escape as quickly as possible from this position, of the hopelessness of which they were all more or less vaguely conscious. So it came about that the council at Maloyaroslavets, when the generals pretending to confer together expressed various opinions, all mouths were closed by the opinion uttered by the simple-minded soldier Mouton, who, speaking last, said what they all felt, that the one thing needful was to get away as quickly as possible, and no one, not even Napoleon, could say anything against that truth which they all recognized. But, though they all realized that it was necessary to get away, there still remained a feeling of shame at admitting that they must flee. An external shock was needed to overcome that shame, and this shock came in due time. It was what the French called l'aura de l'empereur, the day after the council at Maloyaroslavets, Napoleon rode out early in the morning amid the lines of his army, with a suite of marshals and an escort, on the pretext of inspecting the army and the scene of the previous and of the impending battle. Some Cossacks on the prowl for booty fell in with the Emperor, and very nearly captured him. If the Cossacks did not capture Napoleon then, what saved him was the very thing that was destroying the French army, the booty on which the Cossacks fell. Here, as at Tarotino, they went after plunder, leaving the men. Disregarding Napoleon, they rushed after the plunder, and Napoleon managed to escape. When les enfants du don might so easily have taken the emperor himself in the midst of his army, it was clear that there was nothing for it but to fly as fast as possible along the nearest familiar road. Napoleon, with his forty-year-old stomach, understood that hint not feeling his former agility and boldness, and under the influence of the fright the Cossacks had given him, he at once agreed with Mouton, and issued orders, as the historians tell us, to retreat by the Smolensk road. That Napoleon agreed with Mouton, and that the army retreated, does not prove that Napoleon caused it to retreat, but that the forces which influenced the whole army and directed it along the Mozhaisk, that is, the Smolensk road, acted simultaneously on him also. End of chapter 18 This recording is in the public domain. Book 13, chapter 19, read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon A man in motion always devises an aim for that motion. To be able to go a thousand miles, he must imagine that something good awaits him at the end of those thousand miles. One must have the prospect of a promised land to have the strength to move. The promised land for the French during their advance had been Moscow. During their retreat it was their native land. But that native land was too far off, and for a man going a thousand miles it is absolutely necessary to set aside his final goal and to say to himself, "'Today I shall get to a place twenty-five miles off,' where I shall rest and spend the night. And during the first day's journey that resting place eclipses his ultimate goal, and attracts all his hopes and desires. And the impulses felt by a single person are always magnified in a crowd. For the French, retreating along the old Smolensk road, the final goal, their native land, was too remote, and their immediate goal was Smolensk, toward which all their desires and hopes, enormously intensified in the mass, urged them on, 
It was not that they knew that much food and fresh troops awaited them in Smolensk, nor that they were told so. On the contrary, their superior officers and Napoleon himself knew that provisions were scarce there. But because this alone could give them strength to move on and endure their present privations. So both those who knew and those who did not know deceived themselves and pushed on to Smolensk as to a promised land. Coming out onto the high road, the French fled with surprising energy and unheard of rapidity toward the goal they had fixed on. Besides the common impulse which bound the whole crowd of French into one mass and supplied them with a certain energy, there was another cause binding them together, their great numbers. As with the physical law of gravity, their enormous mass drew the individual human atoms to itself. In their hundreds of thousands they moved like a whole nation. Each of them desired nothing more than to give himself up as a prisoner to escape from all this horror and misery. But on the one hand the force of this common attraction to Smolensk, their goal, drew each of them in the same direction. On the other hand an army corps could not surrender to a company, and though the French availed themselves of every convenient opportunity to detach themselves and to surrender on the slightest decent pretext, such pretext did not always occur. Their very numbers and their crowded and swift movement deprived them of that possibility, and rendered it not only difficult but impossible for the Russians to stop this movement, to which the French were directing all their energies. Beyond a certain limit, no mechanical disruption of the body could hasten the process of decomposition. A lump of snow cannot be melted instantaneously. There is a certain limit of time in less than which no amount of heat can melt the snow. On the contrary, the greater the heat, the more solidified the remaining snow becomes. Of the Russian commanders, Kutuzov alone understood this. When the flight of the French army along the Smolensk road became well defined, what Konovnitsyn had foreseen on the night of the 11th of October began to occur. The superior officers all wanted to distinguish themselves, to cut off, to seize, to capture, and to overthrow the French, and all clamoured for action. Kutuzov alone used all his power, and such power is very limited in the case of any commander-in-chief, to prevent an attack. He could not tell them what we say now. Why fight? Why block the road, losing our own men, and inhumanly slaughtering unfortunate wretches? What is the use of that? when a third of their army has melted away on the road from Moscow to Vyazma without any battle. But, drawing from his aged wisdom what they could understand, he told them of the Golden Bridge, and they laughed at and slandered him, flinging themselves on, rending and exulting over the dying beast. Ermolov, Miloradovich, Platov, and others in proximity to the French near Vyazma could not resist their desire to cut off and break up two French corps, and by way of reporting their intention to Kutuzov, they sent him a blank sheet of paper in an envelope. And try as Kutuzov might to restrain the troops, our men attacked, trying to bar the road. Infantry regiments, we are told, advanced to the attack with music and with drums beating, and killed and lost thousands of men. But they did not cut off or overthrow anybody, and the French army, closing up more firmly at the danger, continued while steadily melting away, to pursue its fatal path to Smolensk. End of chapter 19 End of War and Peace, Book 13 by Leo Tolstoy This recording is in the public domain.